ladies and gentlemen, what Keras gives you in her speech is a narrative about what ISIS is about and what Iraq's problems are about, which is overwhelmingly centred on the West. And that's just not the true narrative. And what we're going to do in extension is show you how the problems of Iraq are fundamentally based in Iraq, and the problems that ISIS is, gets its support in response to are problems that you do solve by partition, and that you can only solve by partition. Three things in this speech with substantive and rebuttal sort of interwoven, but I'll like get more substantive as we go. So firstly, this looks funnier on my page than it is to say, but is ISIS something to worry about? The letter IS for it. <laughs> <laughs> Secondly, will this work? Will we be able to effectively invade and partition Iraq? Thirdly, how does partition create a lasting solution to the problems in Iraq? So, is ISIS something we should worry about? Because we get like various ideas at opening up that basically we don't need to. The first thing we hear is that like we shouldn't all at all be worried about them. They're like really small, they're disparate groups, most of their fighters are actually fighting for other things. We'd still tell you three things, as our opening mentioned, right? They're still incredibly brutal. They're still killing people and causing huge numbers of refugees to be driven into neighboring states. That's terrible. They're still taking huge swathes of territory, right? And they're still causing so many deaths and so and so many like displaced persons that the idea that they can't threatened seriously Iraq's status as a state just flies in the face of the reality on the ground right now. Okay, so the next thing they tell us, perhaps realising that that's absurd, is that like, it's, we don't need to worry about them any longer. Like, we've just retaken Mosul down, we've got a new Prime Minister. The crucial thing here is that the advance, the improvements that have been made have only been made in Iraq and Kurdistan, where the Peshmerga are, where those well-trained forces are, where US airstrikes have been concentrated, where US arms have been delivered. There is nothing <coughs> happening in Tikrit on the road to Baghdad, where there are just as many people who are in desperate need of help and aren't getting it at all. So this is the third thing they say, is like, we don't need to fuss about this too much because the Peshmerga can do it. Okay, they're good, but they're struggling. There's not that many of them and they don't have the capacity to fight forever. That's what our opening told you. But moreover, outside Kurdistan, yeah, they sorry. do nothing. Oh, they can't, and they don't want to, because they don't like the other ethnic groups in Iraq. More on that later, but they're fundamentally about protecting their own people in the Kurdish area of Iraq, not about protecting the other children sorry, dying, sorry. the other refugees who are just as much in need of help, and who their non-proposal does nothing to say. This is a huge deal. Moreover, the other tensions that existed prior to ISIS, and if we don't act to partition or remove their long-term cause, are also a huge deal. Secondly, will this work? Not too long on this, because basically what we want to tell you is that the overwhelming force and the overwhelmingly better training that the US military can apply, like the technolo technological advantage that they have, just means that they will be able to smash ISIS extremely effectively, drive them back into Syria, if that's what they want to talk about. And I'll explain later why that's actually a good thing. But moreover, we think that it will be effective in removing the root causes of this conflict, because this is a partition which will take away the incentives that people had to join ISIS, to support that group. Okay. Gareth and Keras tell us, what, uh, Keras tells us, okay, driving ISIS into a largely Sunni area is bad. Okay, we'd say two things. Firstly, if they're so weak, we won't drive them into a largely Sunni area of Iraq. We'll smash them and drive them out of Iraq altogether. They tell us that ISIS are no good. That's what we'll do. But secondly, we'll tell you, even if they are in a Sunni area, Sunnis won't love ISIS so much, won't have a reason to join ISIS once you take away the Shia government that has been repressing them for the, like, for the better part of a decade. Those tensions don't exist when you give them their own government those problems don't arise. Then they tell you, Keras, this is great, Keras tells you and says, like, they'll feel things that are being unfairly divided, the whole problems. It's already the case that people think that yes, like, the divisions being made within Iraq are not fair. That's the driver that is fundamentally at the root of this conflict. And finally, like she says, well, even if you can destroy ISIS, you can't destroy the rhetoric that gives rise to ISIS. We literally can. That's exactly what we do. Because the rhetoric that gives rise to ISIS is not mostly about the West or Islam against the West. The idea of a caliphate is not something that has appeal for most Muslims. What does have appeal is the fact that you are materially losing out every day because the government that governs your country doesn't care about your religion. It's, done, it's oriented against you and people like you. And that inequality and that split of resources is what drives people to acquiesce, to fight alongside ISIS like they tell you. That's what we remove. So, onto that. How does this partition create a lasting solution before that gap? The rhetoric and ideology of ISIS is that of resistance. That is what you give them when you conquer them and kill hundreds of thousands of people, rather than as we want to do, contain them. We're not opping someone else should invade. Okay. 
I mean, the re it's not that important what the rhetoric of ISIS is. What's fundamentally important is the reasons that people have to join ISIS, which isn't about what ISIS wants or about the stated goals of ISIS, but about the people and the way that they're reacting to the situation that they face and why they're driven to join that group. It's not because they love ISIS. It's not because they want an Islamic State to spread like across the entire mapped area that the Islamic State has planned. That's not what it's about. It's about the material losses that those people face. Okay. How does partition create a lasting solution? Let's tell you what we get without partition. You get governments that are inevitably Shia. It's a Shia majority country that doesn't elect Sunni governments. So you get Sunnis not trusting them because for a decade they've been oppressed. For a decade they have got the worst end of material resource splits. You get Kurds who don't trust them and who argue about the borders of their autonomous regions and often fight against that government. That's not going anywhere, right? Successive governments have failed to share rights and treat Sunnis fairly. That is a permanent perception which is coloured by the history of conflict between those groups in that country. Coloured by what happened when Saddam Hussein was in charge. So the fact that there's a new government, a new name, a new face doesn't change that underlying dynamic. The permanent perception that a government that isn't from your group <coughs> cannot treat you fairly. Importantly also though, that's been coloured by events now. The Shia hate the Sunni because, as Gareth tells you, they're acquiescing and fighting alongside ISIS. And the Sunni especially Especially in light of that, never trust that government and return to oppositional politics. So even if ISIS is not a thing, you still get that underlying dynamic which means that conflicts like it will always divide Iraq. What do you get with partition? You get religiously and ethnically divided states which immediately give people a sense of ownership and national coherence, create homogenous communities where those kinds of tensions don't arise, which give people their own government that does treat them fairly on that basis. Remove that need to fight over governments. Importantly, you strengthen their, their armies. One of the reasons the Iraqi army is so useless at resisting ISIS is not that it doesn't have the troops or the technology, but that it is divided ethnically and doesn't have the will to fight or the will to be organised properly in order to resist. You fix that when you get nationally coherent armies. You take away future ISIS by removing those underlying problems. Regionally, Syria, okay, maybe they retreat into Syria, but losing the capacity to flip between those regions is a huge blow. When you strengthen the armies that they have to face on the border with Kurdistan and the border with northern Iraq, by both making those undivided, coherent communities with better, with better armies more able to resist, you hurt ISIS. You make the region better, you make Iraq better. We're incredibly proud to be close.